Welcome to Delightfully Dysfunctional, a podcast about navigating the emotions of the human condition and the challenges that come with it. I'm Kehlani Persian Mason, a psychotherapist and life coach with James Timmons and Ever Curious Human. This is not a replacement for mental health therapy. Please seek out mental health care if that's what you're needing. This is an opportunity for self healers to dive deep and understand more about themselves. Welcome back, Delightful Humans. I'm Kehlani, and this is James, Hi. and we are here for another episode of Delightfully Dysfunctional. Today's topic is how to get unstuck, like mentally unstuck. Not like physically? So, yeah, I don't have answers for that. Okay. I feel like <laughs> in in middle age, my body gets stuck all the time. Like, like Atreyu's ugh. horse in the, in the swamp from NeverEnding Story? Oh my gosh, that? yes, the, it's, wait, yes, sorry, I just is up, that what came up when you thought of getting stuck was Atreyu's well, horse? Physically stuck? Yeah, that's sorry, never that's happened really to me, that is traumatic, that sorry. came out of nowhere, but every, you know what, I feel like our listeners, all of them just got that vision though, now we're all thinking of never ending that's story. One of the, yeah, that was one of the most traumatic moments of my childhood, I I'm think sorry I need to, that No, up. I'm kind of excited because now I want to watch it. I do you I love watching old movies from my childhood and sharing them with my kid. Do you like do you ever do that? Like make them watch your favorite childhood movies. You all watch this. I, I yeah, I had them watch or the original Ninja Turtles cuz we were in, they were all into yes. like the modern day Ninja Turtles. You're like and you don't understand. Well, they were kind of like, mm, nah, this is lame, dude." Like it's Muppets fighting with real people. And I was like, yeah, now that you mentioned that, yeah, I think they... we've come a long way with special effects, you know, <laughs> but I still like it. I like, I like bringing back the old stuff. Yeah. Although like there are some movies that are just gold to this, like back to the future part one, I consider the greatest movie of all time. I think I should really that. greatest yeah. movie of all time. Yeah. Wow. Okay. It's the perfect movie. What about like uh, when you think of high school and like your favorite comedy of mm. that era oh jeez. Like, oh, okay i would say eddie young murphy, adult yeah eddie murphy raw and delirious those are stand-up yeah but that was like very much like the catalog mm-hmm. of my of teen teenage years that's what people were laughing at well no it was, it was old at that point uh-huh but that's, that's what i watched okay you know okay i think i think anchorman was like my high school comedy that was but anchorman you're older than me so you were like in your 20s yeah you were a teenager when that came out yeah yeah, i'm pretty sure (laughs) i was i was well in my adulthood you were an adult yeah Yeah. (laughs) that's funny Uh, yeah mm -hmm. i guess we had like billy madison tommy boy those movies and those were all the ones that like the older siblings of my peer group like watch yeah. so then like we'd end up watching it but it was always a little bit more risque because we were younger like that was my generation yeah although the most <laughs> underrated movie from that whole snl like era was norm mcdonald in dirty work have you seen that movie no it's so funny everyone go watch dirty work and then comment Dirty work yeah. okay it's all right probably the top three funniest movies of, of all time wow okay yeah. i will i will do that you know what else is a really funny movie? Have you ever seen the British version of Death at a Funeral? I haven't even seen the Amer- okay. any version. Well, I don't know. The American version, it's so obvious. Like, it's the same script oh. and you just, like, made that change. I don't get it. I Ma- think it's funny. Like, why didn't everyone just watch the British version? It yeah. was so good. Remember, there was a there was a time there when, remember Julia Stiles? Yeah, she like Julia Stiles. Yeah, it was she would take on she would be in movies that were like a modern day adaptation of like a Romeo or I mean a Romeo a Shakespeare. Oh, because like Ten Things I Hate About You it was like Taming of the Shrew, <gasps> and then she yes. was in the movie O. Did you yep. ever see that uh-huh. with Omar Epps? I think no, no, it wasn't Omar. But oh, Josh Hartnett wasn't he in it? Yes, he was, he was a heartthrob. Yeah, Josh Hartnett. I call him Josh Ooh, Heartthrob. Oh my goodness! <laughs> but and he was from Minnesota. Oh, <laughs> well, and that was like Othello. But see, mm-hmm. she missed it because like she should have been in the Romeo and Juliet with Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire yeah. Danes. That movie, the streak. Mm-hmm. That movie messed like messed me up because it like I was the first time I'd ever been exposed to Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, and it, it's so tragic. Yeah. Like how they were right there, mm-hmm. they almost got, they almost fell in love. That then, did you cry? Yeah, <gasps> I'm about to cry like, right now. Oh no! Oh no! no I'm kidding. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I'm See, now I'm going to be thinking the rest of the day of all, all of the good classics. But, like, in SNL, it was at its prime. My favorite, like, I, I think I'm just obsessed with Will Ferrell, I guess, because he's my favorite, like, SNL. Alum? I think so. Really? Okay, yeah, he's yeah. great. And so, like, the hot tub scene. That's the one that <laughs> makes me laugh the hardest. Hello, lava. Yeah. <laughs> what is happening under the bubble? This is a flurry of activity. <laughs> so, his accent was terrible. You know what's funny is so funny. Will, Ferrell's, Will Ferrell's era was considered, like, post-prime SNL. Oh. Because he came at the, like, the very end, like... Mm. There, at one point, it was Adam Sandler, Mike Myers, Chris Farley, Chris Rock, like all these mm-hmm. legends, and they left and became huge stars. And then Will Ferrell came at the tail end of that, okay. and it was like Tim Meadows and him, and it was lame. Chris Kattan. I should have mentioned this in our last episode because it would have fit in really well. But did in Mad TV there was a skit too, and it was called The Average Asian, and I literally remember the song. And it was like this guy who was at a party, and he's like the my like token minority Asian, and they all come up asking him like, "Please, please make me some origami from your people," and like. You know, you must be great at this and that. And he's like, I don't know. Like, I would, and it was like, he's the average Asian, just a normal guy with Asian persuasion. And like, I don't know. I can't remember the rest of the lyrics. That's funny. But at the end, they're like, please play ping pong, play ping pong. And then all of a sudden, he gets serious and he actually is good at it. But anyway, that's funny. Like, there are so many Asian stereotypes that we talked about Asian in the last uh-huh. episode. But um, like me, I'm only half Asian. So are you. Mm-hmm. I'm a really good driver. Mm. But, and I'm terrible at math, and there's other stereotypes that I don't fit, I won't mention. I'm terrible at math, too. (laughs) (laughs) Continue, My brother is really good at math, though. Because he's an engineer, you said. No, no, he he's he works at a bank, but oh. he he grad he has his math degree. Gotcha. He yeah. enjoys it, and I'm mm-hmm. like, how can you enjoy math? And he's like, because I'm Asian, dude. Because I'm Asian. Yeah, I didn't. That wasn't downloaded as in the genetics yeah. for me either. I guess I didn't inherit any of the Asian stereotypes. You're aging well. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's one thing. Unless Pe- it's the Botox working. No. <laughs> I want to take Botox. <laughs> No. Don't do it. Zach just read a study that says that it inhibits your ability to process other people's emotions because of your mirror be neurons. I, you know how much easier life would be if I was a sociopath? <laughs> It'd be so much easier if you couldn't. Yeah, pick if up, I had no couldn't, empathy. Couldn't, couldn't, if, yeah. if I didn't feel I think, bad. Get it all around the eyes. So yeah. You're dead in the eyes. <laughs> well, here's the thing, though. What I what I read was that um because you know I have Tourette's, so my these muscles are like over the tensing work. more. Yeah. yeah. So if I. I read that it actually is effective for facial oh, tics. Oh. So that's why I wanted that's to experiment. Inter- that actually does make sense. Yeah. That, but you know what's interesting? You don't have any forehead wrinkles. So how does that well, work? Now I do. See? <laughs> Every night he tapes his forehead back. I look young until I <laughs> smile and then my cr- my face just like becomes a raisin. Oh my God. It's like, it's terrible. Being Asian sort of with photos. I'm always like, can you see my eyes? Cause like you can, I get too excited and they just disappear. Yeah. My, f- like gone. when you, when you have that camera that says, uh, make sure your eyes are open. The camera's racist. It's like my eyes are open. I'm just Asian. <laughs> I know I'm trying. Yeah. It's so hard to smile while also like making <laughs> Oh dear. Okay, yeah. we're going off the rails. Anyway, wh- <laughs> what were we talking about? What's the topic of the show? I was singing songs about being an average Asian. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, <clears throat> here we go. Refocusing. The topic is getting unstuck, which That's is right. what we're doing right now. Yes. We're getting unstuck from the debauchery of our conversation. <laughs> we're getting back on track. <laughs> Look, you're, we are. You are a pro segueer. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so what? I, let's define what we mean by getting unstuck. I, I think at some point most humans experience one, if not several, moments in their life when they feel a bit stuck. If we're really being honest with ourselves, yeah, we're not sure what's supposed to happen next. The uncertainty of the options is overwhelming. The path that we had planned out for ourselves has taken a swift detour. We are discombobulated. Mm. We are disoriented. And we're typically also probably feeling a bit hopeless and afraid. Those That's the way that I would define feeling stuck. Mm, would yeah. you add more to that when you think about your experiences of feeling stuck? Yeah, no, I, I think you're right on. Because um, 
for me, we talked in previous episodes about like being true to self mm-hmm. and um, that almost looks like a, like a journey, like a forward progression. And that, but there are ways that I've experienced that I can get derailed from like yeah. pursuing who I'm supposed to be. Yeah, I love that. And, Pursuing who you're supposed to be. Yeah, and usually it's because some external influence um, is, like, giving you self-doubt. Uh, and you're, like, for me, it, it always looked like reverting to people-pleasing, you know, mm-hmm. because I was so hungry for that validation from other people. And, um, but it's 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 been really good to really identify the person that I want to become. And because then I can I can clearly see like if somebody is pulling me away from that then I'm like oh whoa 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 no you're not fitting into who I'm who I am so like you know I need to distance myself from you mm-hmm. and I mean so it, but there's a million other factors that can derail you from that but for me it's just it's usually like an external influence from a person you know? mm-hmm. yeah I think the unstuckness unstuck hmm For me, I think I have typically felt stuck when I'm lying to myself Mm -hmm. and saying yes to too many things. So also like poor boundaries. Like there's, when I reflect back, it's typically in combination with feeling burnout. What you mean? That's where you feel stuck? When I feel stuck. It's usually like I'm feeling burnt out too. I'm feeling like I've taken on too much, which to me is also like the people pleasing. Yeah. Um. And I felt really plagued by that and almost unaware of my role in it for some time. It feels really good to have taken what felt like very radical and uncomfortable changes in my life. Uh, It feels really good to be on the other side of it. Yeah. And I think that's a big part of what it takes to get unstuck is some really radical and uncomfortable changes and a lot of personal accountability in pursuing those baby steps to get out yeah okay so like i guess tell me more (laughs) about about like what how you how you got there Mm. like what what you did to get on to to learn how to become unstuck my my most maybe most recent unstuck or stuck place okay uh Let's see. I think it has healing takes time. So it's been an evolution in the last several years of I was feeling really burnt out from working at the elementary school I was at. We were the largest elementary school in the state of Washington for a while Mm -hmm. with like over 900 kids because there hadn't been a bond approved to build more schools. And I was the only school counselor and Mm -hmm. the American Association of School Counselors recommends more like a 250 student to one counselor ratio so it was a lot and I was in an unhealthy marriage which caused me to say yes to a lot more at work than I normally would have Mm. because I felt very validated at work and I felt like I know what I'm doing here (laughs) apparently when I go home things don't go well and it feels just like more stress so I know what I'm doing here and so I'd say yes to a lot and um, that was part of what contributed to feeling really burnt out and I left the school and went into private practice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Other major changes, divorce, remarriage, kiddo happened really quickly. And in re even in the last year or so of my first marriage, there was a lot of conversation I had with myself when I realized I don't have control over my partner's behavior. I don't have control over when he chooses to pick up a bottle and drink too much. I don't have control about how much he chooses to invest in this. I can only pay attention to what's happening and come to terms with having to make some really big and scary decisions. So when I started doing that, it also opened up an opportunity of what do I want my life to look like? And I, I just kept revisiting that. And that is another one of the tools that actually Phil Stutz highlights is think about that future self, create an image of your ideal self. What are they doing? Who are they around? What are they thinking? What are they feeling? 
What experiences do they have in your life? Like future trip. And I love doing that activity with clients I have. We have conversations. They, we do a collage. And in pursuing any goal, it's good to have an, an idea like that, to paint that picture and also to have flexibility as things change. And that's been a balance that's been a bit trickier for me too, but I think I've found it, which is good. Anyways, all of this just, that was a big piece for me. Well, well then what the heck do I want my life to look like mm. if it's not going to look like the picture that I painted for myself? I've got to start with this blank canvas and figure it out. Have you been at that point before? Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah, because, uh, you know, when at one point I was married and at home and I had this nice big house and a cul-de-sac and we had a, a pond. cul-de-sac life, a pond. Yeah, we had a pond. Damn. I mean, it, the pond is still there, the but um, there. I just don't live there anymore. So like, and I had a great reputation, mm -hmm. everything. So mm -hmm. that was my ideal life. I was living my ideal life, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I tore it all down, you know, uh, because of my own stupid choices. So then it took about a year and a half of a lot of grieving and a lot of radical acceptance and a lot of self-compassion and self-forgiveness. And then just really, because I, where I, where I am now being like a single divorced dad that I would have never wanted to be here. Well, you know, young, when mm -hmm. I was younger, I would have thought this was a nightmare, <clears throat> but, um, but yeah, like you shared, uh, I, I referenced Mel Robbins last pod, last episode too, but I'm going to reference her again. Mm -hmm. So like her, her podcast, don't listen to us first, but also, mm -hmm. you know, I would recommend <laughs> her very first episode of her podcast Episode one, um, she talks about this. She and I and I actually like she she had me. She tells you to take notes, and I actually have the notes right here in front of me. But um, there's uh, four questions. I'm just gonna plagiarize. You think that's okay? It, she says, um, "Yeah, what do I want? Ask yourself these questions. What do I want the next year of my life to look like?" Mm. And then you write, "I don't want to feel." No, I'm reading my answer now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, and then it says, "No matter how you feel, start taking the actions that align with what you want in your yes. life." Yes. And then, um, in making power, or yeah, in making powerful change in your life, find the yeah. proof that you can do it. So, like, what that meant was that I had to kind of ask the question because uh, I, I wrote very specific like characters mm -hmm. like you said like who wh what does that guy look like in yeah. a year from today who's around him what is he what's his facial expression what's his energy all this stuff yeah and i wrote those down and then the final question was like find the proof that 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 can happen and mm -hmm. so i was like okay the people who have accomplished what i'm setting out to accomplish mm -hmm. are they smarter than me no are they like more qualified than me mm -hmm. no so then why on earth is it mm -hmm. not possible for me to get there you know, mm -hmm. and so I like living in that confidence and then just like saying and the trick was when you wrote down all those characteristics of who you plan to be in one year, start acting like that person now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then that, you know, you, you you're that person. Yeah. And pretty soon, like all the circumstances are going to follow yeah. because that person exists now, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Phil how I became calls it the inner authority. But I think that I mean, it's a part of. Nicole, Dr. Nicole LaPera, the holistic psychologist, is a part of her approach. It's yeah. a part of um, Wayne Dyer's approach. I think that for so many um, people that I view as teachers to me, they have that message of mm -hmm. envision what that looks like. Who are those values? Like, what values do you want to show up as yeah. for well, the world, for the people in your life, for yourself, all yeah. of it? And did I, I mean, I, I think I shared, I definitely shared this with you guys prior, but, um, like do you, you know, you've heard of synchronicities. Mm -hmm. So like I, I showed, I told you how, like I had this vision of a podcast with you and Zach specifically. And I even had the text message drafted to Zach about like potentially starting mm -hmm. a podcast. Cause I was like, okay, I know that that is going to be my future somehow. And but I like in my mind, I was thinking it was going to be like real estate related. But then I, I remember thinking like that sounds boring and lame. <laughs> but I, I was like, it's going to be real estate related. But then it would be awesome if Kaylani could be a part of it because then you could like speak into the mental health side of like business or whatever. <laughs> so then I had this text drafted to Zach. And then bring, bring, bring. Well, and I, I and called that, you up. And I was like, no, he, they probably won't go for that. 
Yeah, but then and then like literally two days later is when you messaged me. Oh wow! Unsolicited. I didn't know it was two days. Yeah. Well, it was like very like yeah. within a week. Wow. And so I was like, mm-hmm. and I I shared that with you because I was like, and I just learned about synchronicities, mm-hmm. it, where it's like the people that you like you will attract the people that are supposed to be in your life, and um. So then I was like, okay, well, absolutely we need to do this because we both had the exact same thought. Mm-hmm. And anyway, so that was like really like crazy goosebumps, you know, that that experience. And here we are. And it's it's you know, the podcast is doing well and I mean And and more than that, like we're enjoying it. Yeah. I think that that's that's what's really fun. And that's what is nice. I think that's part of the message that we get to share too. Like find something you enjoy, Mm -hmm. lean in, be curious. When I know that I'm in flow and I'm feeling good, I'm unafraid to ask about an idea. I'm unafraid to put myself out there because the worst thing someone can say is nothing or no. And that just puts me back where I'm I'm already there. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not going any farther. I don't. I can I can operate in a place where I don't take it as a rejection and that's a good sign for me that like you're in a really good headspace and like yeah. you're on the right track. Um I, a couple of ways that I think are really helpful to like define your values or goals or to actually pull up a list of them and look at a sheet. I'll actually include one on my website that will be a free downloadable where you can do this and then I would say highlight 10 when you think about like the person that you want to be, your highest self. Mm -hmm. where or how we would define in internal excuse me how we would define an internal family systems theory the sense of self is someone who's creative connected you feel um, cooperative compassion all of those c words that we've talked about in a previous episode when you feel those values assess kind of what percent are you showing up as Mm -hmm. in each of them so if respect for others is one how like give yourself a rating grade yourself Mm -hmm. and then that gives you a bit more direction and oh you know what i'm not showing up authentically or i'm not showing up like loyalty what areas do you need to maybe give some more attention to yeah i think that that's a nice way to be more clear and then to take a step further what does it mean to be more fill in the blank what does it mean to show up and be more authentic? What's an example of that? Yeah. Who do I know who shows that? In fact, that would be another way to get unstuck. Who do you know who's living life the way that you like? Like yeah. who's living life according to your value system and you admire? Do you want me to answer that? You can if you have someone. <laughs> I think that it could be a hypothetical question too because well, it mean, might be more than one. It's silly, but... My answer is my future self. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, Using a, that back as a barometer. Yeah, yeah I don't know. That it, it, I don't know if that's a lame, if that's a cheating answer. But um, I think it ties in that previous activity of like envisioning, like that. Just like that is my goal of becoming that person. Yeah. So like, why compare with someone yeah. else? They're not going to get it right, and that's oh, that's okay. It's kind yeah. of. What works for you might not be what works for the next person. Yeah. Another strategy that I think can be helpful, Stutz calls it the Jeopardy strategy. I just think that if you notice catastrophizing, which is an unhelpful thought of that worst case scenario, like that feeling it would be the end of the world, I encourage you to finish out the thought and really assess if it is... um, a workable problem is there i mean are you going to survive and most mm. of the time the answer is yes yeah. <laughs> like most of the time is like yeah it would really suck it would be really hard but would i survive yeah and life doesn't happen at our ideal vision it doesn't happen according to the perfect path that's laid out and following it it happens when how we navigate the twists and turns that are unexpected yeah and to acknowledge that that's a normal part of life it's supposed to be uncomfortable sometimes it's supposed to be uncertain sometimes if you can feel more ease in navigating that it's a whole hell of a lot more enjoyable yeah i mean i i feel like the way that i would live my life was i would always wait for some breakthrough or to catch a break but then I realized that life actually exists in a slow incremental growth mm-hmm. in a process. 
And then there's people who say, and this is good advice for the most part, uh, like fall in love with the process, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, but then I've learned that it's not so much falling in love with the process. It's more that like have a clear vision of where you want to be and then just understand that there is a process. There's a pathway to, you know, to it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you don't have to like necessarily love it. (laughs) Because if if you're expecting like the feeling of love to come while you're going through a process. Yeah, that's true. You don't have to love it. But Mm -hmm. I think that you can maybe find gratitude even in the sucky parts. If you know that it is a suffering that is meant to benefit you in the long run, which is a part of logotherapy or Viktor Frankl, who we've spoken about. He wrote Man's Search for Meaning. Mm -hmm. His whole foundation of what he believes is can you find meaning in suffering while cultivating gratitude, while focusing on the meaning that you get to fill in your life? You yeah. get to fill what those values are. Mm. Life isn't here to say, this is the meaning, follow the rules. Yeah. You are here to say to life, this is the meaning that I want to infuse into my time here because we are just a speck on this rock that is like floating through space and we have an unknown amount of time that we are here. Yeah. Like, I think it can be really helpful to put in perspective when you look at the stars, when you look at a mountain range, when you look at the ocean, when you remember how small we really are. Mm. Well, a lot of my big concerns and worries don't seem as big in that moment. Yeah. And you really are able to have this vision of, well, the meaning that I want to have in life, that's me. I have to, I have to do that. This world does not owe me that. Yeah. You have to define what you want your life to look like. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, for some reason thought I saw a golden retriever in the corner of my eye. (laughs) Anyway. Um, yeah. And that's something that it's, and that's the perfect word like stuck because there's been a lot of times where my problem or my self-talk or my chaotic thoughts are so huge and I'm so hyper-focused on them that I can't even imagine getting beyond them. And But it's really uh, important to remind yourself that whatever pain you're feeling or experiencing, that it's temporary and you you've survived every single situation so far you know, and like Steve Harvey has this um, reel that I saw where he says, there's no such thing as over. If you woke up this morning, it's not over. I mean, you know, eventually all of us will die. Mm-hmm. But if you're listening to this, you obviously haven't gotten there yet. So, <laughs> um, yeah. You, and it, and for me lately, I've been so um, mindful about just trying to win the day because if you compound a bunch of one days you know on top of each other eventually you're going to reach like so many goals that you never thought were possible but um yeah so it's really i mean yeah slow incremental progress that's been like the theme of this year for me yeah and anyone who we might classify as as being successful Mm -hmm. we probably just don't know them well enough to know what those ups and downs look like to be honest like um, Steven Spielberg was rejected from film school three times. Mm. Walt Disney was fired from his newspaper job. Oh, you know, like Oprah Winfrey was fired. Yeah, we don't think about like all of those people had a moment when they felt not enough and they felt, What's the point? and yeah. they felt like, I don't have anything special to give. And we don't view them that way now. So if there's a message in your head that's saying, I don't deserve X, Y, and Z, or I'm not going to make it, there's comparison with others, that that is a critical voice in your head. That's not the truth. Your thoughts are not facts, and it's holding you back. That's And that's such a great point, because just lately there was a situation where I was like, convincing myself of something that was not reality and then responding to it, you know, and then Mm -hmm. I just like talk myself out of it and like, James, you're, this is not reality. You can't live in this, in this, you know, false reality of your brain. But, um, yeah, so that's all good stuff. (laughs) Yeah. Some of the other 
thinking traps. I wasn't going to go into this necessarily in this episode, but it feels like it's a good fit. Like it's not just the catastrophizing of like <gasps> that worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. Like the example I think that's easiest is, is like, um, I didn't turn in my papers, so I'm not going to get a good grade. And if I don't get a good grade, then I'm not going to go to college and I'm going to live in a box on the side of the road. It's just like spiraling out. Yeah. And if we were really rooted in some logical thinking, too, that would be helpful. Like DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy and how to find wise minds. So I'm not just going to be stuck in my emotional mindset of mm. what if, what if, what if in the panic. Yeah. And then the logical side is kind of dry and, you know, well, you would survive. It's just a grade. It's the combination, if we picture a Venn diagram, it's that middle space that's the wise mind that might sound more like, yeah, I feel really panicked right now. My grades are really important to me. I also know that it's not the end of the world mm -hmm. and that I'm still going to be able to achieve my goals. Even if it's uncomfortable, it's passing. It's not going to be like forever, this yeah. feeling. It's not going to be what I'm worried about in two weeks. That's wise mind. I can acknowledge it. I'm not dismissing how I feel, yeah. but I'm able to talk through it in like a self-compassionate way. Yeah. And that self-compassion helps you. It's not, it helps you not feel fearful of the steps that you're about to take versus if that negative voice in your head is saying, yeah, you're a dumbass. You're never going to get it right. Why the fuck do you try? <laughs> Like you're not going to have the motivation to take that next step. So that self-compassion does cushion you. And I find it to be more accurate and more true. Um, it cushions you so that you're able to have the momentum instead of kind of like draining your life force out of that inner criticism that you're hearing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I experienced that kind of stuff when I would be really hyper-focused on like my nutrition. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, oh my gosh, I had a donut today, so I might as well just binge for the rest of the day because yeah. I already failed. And then it would be like a week and then I'd have to, and it would mm -hmm. be like really extremes on both sides. Yeah. But it's really, you know, yeah, the proper response, like wise mind, what you're describing is, that's okay. Like, it's, you're not going to be perfect, so like we're going to do better tomorrow, you know? And it's kind of a combination of what um, Mark Goldston and Philip Goldberg, they wrote Get Out of Your Own Way. And they talk about not only identifying self-sabotaging behaviors, mm. but also practicing self-compassion in a growth mindset, which is a bit of what we're speaking to. Growth mindset means instead of seeing a setback or a challenge, we can see them as an opportunity to grow mm -hmm. or like the self-sabotaging behaviors, we do have to be aware of like, when are we getting in our own way? Mm -hmm. When is this like that negative self-talk that's a self-sabotaging behavior that stops me from feeling the momentum for my goal? Well, then I should want to try and figure that out yeah. and practice self-compassion. Yeah. A lot of people set really lofty goals too. And it's part of like their, their, there's an excitement and I think like lofty gym goals is a really common one. And uh, there's a reason why probably in March, the gyms are a lot thinner than they were in January. <laughs> like it might not have been an attainable goal. Yeah. So that's an important part to feeling like we're getting that momentum, setting an attainable goal, achievable. Well, and I think, yeah. I, I, and I think people also were so conditioned to like be everything on demand. We want the results now, you know, because, um, yeah, like I said, the where life truly exists is slow incremental process. Because I, I feel it's it's okay to set really ambitious goals, but then to have a realistic approach to it. Um, like for example, uh, on our TikTok or whatever, I'll um, you know, we had one video that did really well, and then so every reel from that point on, in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh my gosh, I went every video to hit a million views, you know, but then some of them will be like 200 views and some will be like, you know, 10,000 or something. And then, so then the way I've like <laughs> taken away the disappointment of like the low, I'm like, okay, well that's like maybe four or five people that subscribe to the podcast, you know? Mm -hmm. So we're still growing just not as quickly as I'd like, you know, but, um, yeah. So that's kind of the same idea where I, I have to, uh, just be really optimistic and look at the incremental progress rather than wanting the massive results immediately, you know? And I think understanding that's where being curious might be helpful for you or for someone else experiencing the same kind of like wanting that immediate satisfaction. Like, well, 
what is the standard rate for someone doing this type of work, I think we'd probably be surprised that mm -hmm. we're doing quite well given oh, yeah. our, you know, we're, we're our amateur interest and passion. <laughs> so it's, it sets a different tone of how to view the situation. Sometimes we have to, most often I would say, we have to change our perspective about a situation to solve the problem. Yeah, Solving the problem doesn't mean it goes away, just to ease the discomfort. That's maybe a better way to say it. Yeah. So, which is one of Wayne Dyer's, changing our thoughts. That's one way that we can get unstuck is to kind of just be able to shift the way that we're viewing the reality of the situation. Yeah. And essentially, when it comes, this is an area that I find a lot of people get stuck in, is the being curious. Like when they have a goal, there's not enough curiosity. And maybe I'm just the opposite. Maybe I'm just wired differently because I go in and I'm like researching everything oh, yeah. about it. And, you know, I need to know everything. Yeah. If there's a goal that I'm wanting. And a lot of the, I work with a lot of clients who are in transition in their life and are kind of navigating some of this. Obviously they're felt stuck and they want to feel unstuck. Mm. In that headspace of where anxiety and depression are ripe to breed, I think that curiosity takes a lot of energy. I agree. Yeah, I mean, because to be curious means that you have to like turn your brain on to be ready to receive information. Mm -hmm. And pff, that's that's like boring sometimes. And I think it's exhausting. Mm. I think it's like, oh, you want me to like dare to hope that something good can happen? <laughs> it's so much easier to just numb out and disassociate oh, by man. playing video games that. or yeah. watching TV or whatever vice. And uh, getting unstuck might require some radical action yeah. or changes in thinking. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this thought is even related, but... <laughs> um, yeah, like the, the, what I've just noticed from my own life is I used to always set really ambitious goals and then I would just fall flat on my face and then give up. But then I, where I'm at today, all those failures uh, prepared me to be way more realistic and then resilient mm -hmm. um, with, with setting goals. And like, I read this book recently called uh, Winning the War in Your Mind. And um, me and some friends are now going through that book together, and it's a really great book. Highly recommend. But mm. it's um, like one thing that he talks about in that book is called mental ruts, where like he uses the analogy of like a dog in the backyard. Like whenever a dog has to go poop, they just run the exact same path, and after a while, they've worn down mm. this rut. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's like in our own brains, where we respond to a certain situation, we automatically go to where the rut is. So in order to get unstuck, mm -hmm. you have to like consciously create a new mental rut. And then eventually the more you, you do that, the, the easier it becomes. Yeah, that's exactly right. It has to do with the neurons and the dendrites in our brain. Neurons are the cells in our Big brain. Words. And we could maybe like for, lack of a better oh we have an actual brain but there's no like neurons pictured in it but like if a neuron looked like a blob with these are my dendrites uh -huh. the strengthened path it's like the connection is so solid so it feels like that well-paved road it feels like that path that dog is going on uh -huh. and especially like in childhood it's hardwired so yeah. you know that's even stronger a connection for some of the paths that feel the most difficult to break out of like people pleasing because mm -hmm. that typically comes from some kind of inadequate parenting that kind of cultivated that and our society that we're in very much cultivates a sense of inadequacy so it is uncomfortable to heal <laughs> It feels easy to stick in this unhealthy pattern, even though it isn't more beneficial. Yeah. So, so much of what I do is like motivational interviewing where I'm just like, do you want to feel better? Please let me explain why it can be better for you yeah. and you can work on this other path and it doesn't always have to feel so hard, but there's so much hesitancy because that would require being more uncomfortable. Yeah. So it's almost like sometimes people come to me and they're like, prove it. Uh, Pro why should I? Yeah. And that's 
that's hard because you should want to again like i don't have the magic wand for you when you're sitting in front of me i can only engage and then that opportunity is yours you have to you have to take some action self-efficacy is what we're wanting in as a therapist which means that my clients feel as though their hands are on the steering wheel and they can navigate mm. so you have to want to at least touch the steering wheel yeah well, and it, like in my opinion, that's why it's so important to have a very clear vision of uh, like your destination, of who, who you want to become, mm -hmm. because without that, you're just it's just yeah, it's kind of like a total blind leap of faith. Yeah. Why, like, why should I carve carve these new ruts when like this is I'm I'm so familiar with these all all these ruts that I've have out for my life, you know. But it's like, well, yeah, that's mm -hmm. where it's gotten you today, and yeah. So I mean. I, I don't know. We should almost, do you think we should encourage everyone to like pause right now and like write a descriptive uh, characteristics of who they want to be in a year or something? Yeah, I would love that. They should definitely check out the link that I'm going to be including with this episode that has the list of the values. And then when you pick the 10 that you have, like help that it be a part of a journaling activity for yourself on like who that person is. And it's funny, I love that you flipped your notebook right open to your own notes because mm -hmm. I forgot to mention this earlier, but I was cleaning my office over the weekend and I found in almost a similar notebook, the same thing. I was talking about what do I wanna change? What does mm -hmm. that look like? What does that mean I'm gonna have to do? Oh. What do I want in my life? What experiences do I want? How do I get there? You've gotta reverse engineer your goals to yeah. figure out where your starting point is and yeah. know where you wanna go. Mm -hmm. I love talking about smart goals too, because that's part of what you're mentioning is your lesson had to be really understanding what an achievable goal was. Mm -hmm. So you weren't disappointed. Mm -hmm. So smart goals, that's the acronym. It needs to be specific, mm -hmm. measurable, achievable, relevant, time bound. So you know, like when you want to be completing yeah. it. You should be able to evaluate it. And so this is actually smarter goals. So I'm adding a couple more. <laughs> you have to be able to evaluate it and adjust and change and readjust. I love that there is an evaluate and a readjust that has kind of been yeah. added to the original acronym, which was just smart goals. So smarter, smarter goals. Ooh, that's good. And so maybe start with, okay, being specific. What is it that you want measurable like okay what how would we measure it is this going to yeah. happen by how many times in a week or like if it's working out i encourage people to not start with their like five days a week maybe the big goal maybe it starts with two days a week and you can feel confident in getting that and then add another day yeah and ease your way in that's part of the readjusting i love it I'm kind of like borderline tempted to just read what I wrote for my I wish I would have brought my future I person. But Oh, is this for the future partner? The, no, no, no. This no, is just for who you. I want to be. Yeah. Well, I wrote this on Yeah, what's the October date? October 29th. Oh, wow. And um so we're a few months in already. Okay. Jeez. Okay. Okay, let's hear it. Okay, okay, I'm gonna read it. This is very scary I know, and vulnerable you for me. You weren't planning on this, no, huh? But I just want to like, I don't know if it's even a good example. But sorry, I'm already downplaying it. Can you can you feel <gasps> my people pleasing? Oh no, you can do it. Okay, okay. So it says, and I remember I that it's level five is what I labeled it. Mm. That's like the highest version of myself. Yeah. Um. Okay. Unshakable confidence. Always positive. Thinks the best about people, knows how valuable he is, extremely creative, wise, bright countenance, effortless hard worker, natural leader, attractive and attractional, rejects negativity, rejects impulses, rejects invasive thoughts. It's long, sorry. Mm. Directs his imagination to create amazing things. Respected, popular, does not need validation from anyone, does not need love, but chooses love and chooses who can be in his life because it's a privilege to know him. Mm. <laughs> mm. It sounds really conceited when I'm reading no. it back. But I, can I, I think the, I think there's a lot of really great things. The only thing that I would share that's coming from a place of wanting you to have more compassion for yourself is that 
wanting popularity and also not wanting to care about people yeah. feel in contradiction. And there were some moments of that, but I feel like who you are now is even different than who you were in October when you made it. Yeah, exactly. And it'd be interesting to see if you like revisited it, what would come up. Well, as I read that, that's th- those were two thoughts that I had. I was like, okay, popular. I don't really need that. You know? Yeah. And so that's funny. Yeah. Cause like, I'm glad I said what date I wrote that. What's that? October, November. October, November, December, January. Five months? Yeah, okay, almost five, almost five months, yeah. yeah. So, um, gosh, we're almost halfway through that year. Um, this is a really cool way to highlight, though, how much we can change. Like, our internal world can change yeah. in that time frame. And it's, I don't know, it, it's an important for us to, like, cultivate that relationship with ourself. And writing things out is such a good way to get, like, our unconscious out. Because, yeah. honestly, what that's saying is that you were still healing and you hadn't figured out that people-pleasing yeah. had to be cut out of your life in order to achieve your highest exactly. self. And you just didn't get it yet. I wrote this, I remember I was, uh, like, kind of gone back to a very toxic situation and I was, like, heartbroken the day that I wrote this. Mm. And so, um, yeah, I'm in a a million miles away from there. So like a few, I need to amend this, but I did just notice I wrote at the very end leans into discomfort. Mm. So, um, yeah, I mean, I still very much, you know, would like to be that person. And I feel like I am that person today, but, um, I think you're an amended version because like being confident in every situation and also leaning into discomfort to me, confidence means the absence of discomfort. And maybe that isn't the right definition. Maybe not. You can be confident and yeah. still no, I feel like be uncomfortable. My definition of confidence is betting on yourself. Okay. You know? I like that. Okay. And like, I like that definition. There's still, there's still discomfort. And Trust in self. Yeah. It's still scary, but okay. just like knowing that, yeah. um, like, oh no, we're like, we're going to be okay. We're going to, you know, we're not going to yeah. jump. We're not going to abandon ship. Like, cause mm-hmm. I know where I'm going and I'm awesome. <laughs> you know? That guy, like Yeah. Okay. I get it. I felt that feeling with this project when I would feel an insecurity coming up, I kind of felt more like, well, I'm confident in my ability to know myself and to communicate how I'm feeling or to communicate with other people, even if they disagree. Yeah. So if I can trust on that, it feels okay. Yeah. The ultimate end goal is just to be a multimillionaire, if I'm being completely honest. Just That's kidding. your end goal. I've got <laughs> And then I'm just gonna and I'm gonna be level zero after I make Levels dollars. Yeah. Don't go to level zero, James. <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna give in to all my impulses now. Uh, now that I have all the money. No, no. I have to reel you in. Is that I have a bad to idea? be <laughs> Sorry, I'm just being transparent. Oh my gosh. Just kidding. <laughs> All right. It is time for our advice section of our podcast. I feel a little bit like Frasier sometimes when it's this section. Did you ever watch that? Yeah. Yeah. That was like on, like my parents watched a lot of Frasier. Okay. And he's like calling in. Hello, listener. I'm, I'm here. I mean, that, that show <laughs> did really well, so I'll take it. <laughs> Okay, so this person is writing in and they said, I found out recently that I'm probably going to be let go from my job, Mm. but only found out through another coworker and I'm finding my job position listed online. I've had no communication with my boss um, that anything has been wrong and I feel very blindsided. The same situation or similar has also happened to me before in a previous job. I know it's not all because of me, but I'm finding it really hard to accept and love myself when this is the second time it's happened. Mm. And there's still a part of me that blames myself. What can I do? Oh, dear delightful human. I am so sorry because there's so much confusion and it seems like unclear communication happening around this, this problem. And that can always create a scenario that causes us to overthink and ruminate yeah i mean i would say um yeah no it you do have value and i would not yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't believe that lie because um and businesses and things uh you know jobs are there's so many components that go into like how they operate like Mm. especially in today's um, like economy, if some people get laid off just because it, it their job can't be supported, f- you know, by the company or whatever, 
but um i don't know if that's the case with this situation but um there are a lot of like yeah behind the scenes things that we don't know in this scenario so i think that that's an important thing to remember if you notice your mind maybe trying to come to a conclusion that is taking on more blame than you should yeah i think there's a lot that we don't know and it's not again i I always go back to the word effective like is that an effective way to move on and to improve and if the answer is no even if it feels like a dangling carrot Mm -hmm. to want to go down that path in your brain then adjust and distract yourself in that moment and kind of remind yourself of well if there was this type of poor communication i guess part of my takeaway is that that might be an indication for this delightful human that it's not the right position for them yeah that a position for them is one where they would feel really comfortable and th- and thrive or feel more fulfilled so i wouldn't want them to dwell on feeling like they it's all their fault but like on what would be a more maybe make more of a list of what is what does a healthy workplace look like what is it that you might want to look for in that because i'm sensing some unhealthy workplace dynamics with there not being communication you're finding out through a coworker the way it's being posted like that's it doesn't feel as professional as yeah. as I w- would hope that this company would be running. So I think that that's, that's another thing for this person to take into account. Now, yeah. when it, I do think personal accountability is important. So what they might be learning is perhaps they need to step in and be the one to ask for feedback from their mm. boss in the future. That's the only thing that I could think of is, yeah. you know, being able to check in and say, hey, I'm just wanting to get some feedback to see if there's anything I could be doing better or different yeah. or that kind of checking in and, and taking on that piece. But yeah. I think moving on with with hope for something that's a better fit is kind of the only thing that you have control of right now. For sure. Yeah, I have two thoughts. Yeah. Like the first, um, yeah, I mean, it's... <laughs> I remember, Kayla, you had said one time in a previous episode, um, like if somebody is showing, uh, is 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 kind of leaving your life, then thank them. Mm. Remember, and so in this situation, it's kind of like it's yeah, it sounds like a toxic work environment. I was once in a a work environment where I was afraid to lose my job, like every day, and it was mm. horrible. I yeah, hated it. Oh, that kind of anxiety. Yeah, and Oof. then I did lose my job, and mm. then um. And it, like all those, uh, you know, f- self fulfilled prophecies, but it affected my performance because of that fear. And mm-hmm. so I just waited every day to get fired. And then eventually I did, but because I crippled myself, I, I tied my hands behind my back because mm-hmm. I, that's how I was like approaching everything. Oh my gosh, am I going to get fired? No confidence. So it's like, you know, it's, it's up to you to, to have that that confidence and that kind of bravery regardless of situation. I mean, and sadly, there are a lot of work environments that are toxic mm-hmm. like that and and you can only do so much. Yeah. I'm eager to have a whole episode on toxic workplace culture oh, be because cool. I think that there's a lot of people, I think almost everyone has experienced it at some point. Yeah. And it can be incredibly draining so that I love everything that you're saying, James, when it comes to advice for this person of mm-hmm. like, you know, pick up on this not being something that fit for you either. Yeah, you're going to be healthier and happier. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and then there's another thought. Um, Brene Brown, who we talk about all the time, (laughs) she says, uh, clear is kind, unclear is unkind. And that fits in so many areas of life um, where, like, let's say, for example, there's somebody who is uh, sending you mixed messages and uh, that's that's unkind. That's not clear. Mm-hmm. But then I learned that the onus is on me also to like, number one, ask for clarity. Mm-hmm. You know, that's scary, though, because a lot sometimes if you ask for clarity and they, they give you the answer you don't want, that's going to hurt. Yeah. But um, it's, in, a, in a workplace, though, it's it's almost like it's welcomed. Like you're going to be you're going to be more respected if you approach you know, your employer and say, Hey, here's how I'm feeling. And Mm -hmm. I just, I just want to put this on the table. Like, please give me clarity because the pain that you're going to give me, if you give me the answer I don't want is going to hurt. 
but it's not going to be as bad as this stretched out mm-hmm. marathon of pain that you're already subjecting me to. So like hit me of with it now. Uncertainty, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, but it's like the, those, that moment where you have to just conjure up that bravery for like three minutes yeah. and just go into it, you know? I, I think that that's more my style naturally. And I literally, I remember doing this when I was even really young, maybe before like having to speak in front of a class or speak to a person of authority. Like I would have that resistance and I would just I had an agreement with myself in my head that when you're going to count to three and you're just going to do it without uh, thinking. It's so scary. But yeah, but then like that's where you find like, like that's where you build your best life. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. And it's like, okay, my commitment to myself is that I'm peeling off this band aid on the count of three. Yeah. <laughs> and you do it. And then it usually, I mean, yeah, it usually goes well. Though. As long as it's like a, not an, imp- I mean, it sounds like it's impulsive the way I'm describing it, but it's no. always a well thought out. It's the opposite of impulsive. Yes, it really is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's done very with an intention. It's just getting over that last hurdle of yeah. discomfort. Oh, man. That's, yeah, that's where success lives. Is just like, okay, I'm gonna throw myself into this. Oh my gosh, Zach. I, okay, okay. That's our advice for this person. And now I have a story. Okay. <laughs> Zach has been doing the cold showers and like the cold plunge yeah. stuff. Ooh, yeah. yeah that, uh-huh. That's a gr- Yes, go. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, so I think he's like a month in and he he's improved so much in his ability to be like more comfortable in that water, but it's it's also Like there's a reason why top performers talk about doing something like that. It's kind of that one, two, three, go thing. It's like I'm in control of my body. I get to tell I tell my body what we're doing, even if it's going to be something uncomfortable, like stepping into a freezing cold shower in the morning. And then that helps you feel more in control of like orchestrating the tasks that you need to do in the day. Well, okay, I already did something I didn't want to do this morning. I've strengthened that pathway. So now I can eat the frog and do this other thing that although uncomfortable is in alignment with my higher values and my goals in life. And so I'm able to one, two, three, go. Mm -hmm. And it feels easier. And I think that's the thing. Like when you meet resistance, is it because it isn't aligned with you and your intuition knows that? Or is it because you need to rise to the occasion to take accountability for your life yeah. and to have the courage to take a step, even if it's uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. That's the that's like that defining moment that you need to sit with and figure it out and yeah. navigate. And I think it does take speaking to a professional if needed, mm-hmm. speaking to a really trusted friend, writing it out, read books, do research. I think you have to navigate that. Speaking of, I do have a current wait list, but if you would like to see me as a client, as a therapist, or as a life coach, you may reach out to me. (laughs) My email and website information will also be listed in the podcast, but there's lots of ways to find that clarity. Yeah. It's, I mean, you could just start a podcast with you and then you get free counseling. You can just keep listening to this podcast. (laughs) True. Like, subscribe, Comment nice things, please. <laughs> what a perfect segue to the outro. Wow, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Thank you so much, Delightful Humans, for joining us. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Bye.